we go from the body to the breath, the breath to the mind. And then we really increase our mindfulness enormously, it becomes so strong and also so happy. With that happiness comes a lot of courage. So when we go back to our body, then we can really see it really clearly. But if you don't have the stillness of mind, then you can't really have the wisdom which comes. To quote the Buddha, Samadhi Pachiya Yata Bhuta Yana Dasanang. He said that many, many times in the suttas. From stillness, from Samadhi, you see things. That is the cause for seeing things as they really are in the st from the stillness. When you haven't got that stillness, your hindrances, they call them the five hindrances. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Those five hindrances, they distort reality. So what you're seeing is not what's really there. You're adding on to things. That's sometimes what happens if one meditates on sensations in the skin, but your mindfulness isn't strong. It means you don't see very much. At least you think you are seeing things, but it's not deep. Uh, okay, I cannot see the uh, question to the right here. I can only see after, half of it. Dear Ajahn, what is the something of death meditation? Uh, I can't see that one because the pictures are in the way. So we can, I'll go down to another question. Mm. How Buddhism view of divorce when wife keep asking for it? <laughs> it's nothing wrong with divorce because you know, every time relationships like everything else are impermanent, they do have the use by date. And sometimes why a man and a woman marry together, you don't really know why they're the causes are, but sometimes you know it doesn't work out, and it's no fault of either partner. That's really important to know. So don't blame people, don't blame yourself. But you know that that's the reality that you know it's not working out, and maybe you made a mistake, or the two of you have changed. We always change in life, but sometimes people change in different directions, and soon the gap gets so so far apart that there's nothing really to tie you together as in a relationship. So it really depends sort of, you know, what the reasons are. And if the wife keeps asking for it and, you know, you don't want it, then you ask, you know, what, what can we do? But please, I, uh, for those of you in Singapore, I think you all know Ang Bin Chu. She told me this story, which I thought was very, very funny. If you haven't heard it before, here it comes. Uh, okay, I'm going to drag the Bixer box to the bottom. I've just got some... Questions, see if I can do this. Yeah, yeah, done it. Very good, excellent. Yeah, you can see. Excellent, great. So anyway, this was from Ang Beng Chu, when she said that uh, this um, marriage council, I think it was her, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, one of her clients said she really wanted to divorce her husband, really wanted to divorce him. And uh, she said, well, if you divorce your husband now, he'd probably be very happy to get rid of you. So do you want that to happen? She said, no, I don't want to give him any type of happiness whatsoever. So said the marriage counselor, try this. You know, just go to the hairdresser, let's get a new hairstyle, get some new clothes, you know, just start to smarten yourself up and just be kinder to him. Because the plan is that he fell in love with you once. After a while, if you just, you know, just uh, you know, act a bit more, um, I'm not supposed to word, use the word sexually, but I think you know what I mean that act a bit more sort of uh, nicely to your husband, then, you know, he may fall in love with you again. And then when he falls in love with you again, then that's the time to divorce him. That really hurt him. And that's what they said. That was the plan they agreed on. Okay. So then it started working, you know, that he started coming home earlier from work and he was much nicer to her, gave her better presents, especially at times of like Christmas. And then uh, she, the counselor said, is he falling in love with, with you? He said, yes, I think he is. He said, great, carry on. Maybe now a few more weeks and then he can divorce him. And that would really hurt him. And that was the plan. But then, then the woman stopped coming to the counselor. So the counselor rang the woman up and said, how's it going? Oh, he's really in love with me now. When he comes back really early, it's really good. Great, she said, now's the time to divorce him. Said, no, he's so wonderful now. Who wants to divorce him? 
And the counselor said, that was my plan all along. And I just got you to dress up and be nice and kind because it was fulfilling what your first intention was to hurt him. But now when you experience that kindness enough, you don't need to divorce him. And so they lived happily ever after. That was the story in brief. I thought that was quite funny. Maybe it's just because I'm a monk, I don't understand these things. But nevertheless, that you fell in love once, why can't you fall in love again? Maybe. But anyway, how Buddhism views divorce when wife keep asking for it, if, if you think that's a thing to do. If you have children, some of them are quite wise, especially if they're in the 13, 14 or above. They say, mommy and daddy, I don't know why you keep living together. Some children say that because you're not happy together. We want you to be happy. So how we, we view divorce, it's really you know, up to what you think is the best thing to do. Dear Ajahn, what is the main purpose of death contemplation? Is it to give rise to some wake? Can Ajahn lead a meditation session on that subject, assuming that it's not too morbid for most participants? Well, yes, sometimes you do the death meditations, but very rarely. It's the one which I do teach, which I always thought was very, very helpful. The, in the retreats, those of you who are, are having this retreat in a hotel or in a, a temple somewhere, that sometimes you'll be encouraged to do what we call walking meditation. Because you can't sit on your bottom all day and you get so sore. So you have to do something. So the Buddha just, uh, developed this walking meditation where you find a nice path, maybe about, it could be anything from 10 meters to 20 meters long, around that sort of length. And you start at the, the beginning uh, with your eyes cast down, maybe looking a body length in front with your eyes open because you don't want to hit something or step on something you shouldn't. And then you start walking naturally, but being aware of all the sensations of just one sort of uh, foot, one leg moving and moving forward and then stepping down again. And I'm sure that that will be explained in greater detail later on, but to do that with death meditation, as you are moving, you say to yourself, when your left foot starts stepping, I will die. As the right foot moves, that's for sure. In Bahasa, so Tasva doesn't have to do so much work, you say Mati Pasti. Left foot Mati, I will die Pasti, for sure. And people think that's a joke. Sometimes I think it's a joke because I teach it. And I think I just teach jokes, but I say it as something which is quite strange at first. And people think it's funny, but you keep doing that. I will die. That's for sure. I will die. That's for sure. What happens is, you know, that's the truth. You can't deny that. And so after a while, you realize this is something which you may not even be a Buddhist, whatever religion. You know, that's so true. And then you get to fear. The fear that you have to let go of all these attachments you own. And I will die, that's for sure. And then actually you start thinking that it's not so bad to let go of these things. And you go through fear and you keep on walking, I will die, that's for sure. And on the other side of that fear, you feel a great deal of peace. All the things you worry about, you realize you don't have to worry about them. All the things which you are anxious about, you're going to die anyway, so. There's no problem at all. So you feel a great, great, great sense of freedom by doing a death meditation. It helps to lessen our attachments to this world. And you have to let go of them sooner or later. So it's a little bit of a training and you find it's nowhere near as bad as people feel. Letting go of attachments to this world is a great sense of freedom. Oh, you just all the weights of worry which you have in the world, paying your bills, and, even just fixing up your house or fixing up all these other problems, you're free now. You know, you left, you left school, you don't have to do your homework anymore because you're dead. Oh, how beautiful that could be. So that becomes a death contemplation, which is one which I do and I teach. Other death contemplations, there are always so many we can do, but the main point is, is to realize that we're attached to things we don't really need to be attached to. You can imagine what it's like letting it all go. Just imagine not really letting it go. Those things will be there for you afterwards, but just imagine what it must be like. Freedom, peace. Ah, oh, so nice. 
I imagine my death contemplation. Oh, I don't need to teach my monks anymore. Oh, I don't need to worry about paying the bills anymore. Oh, I don't need to worry about traveling and, and giving talks anymore. I'm free. So that's death contemplation. Oh my goodness, people are scrolling down now. And so there's lots of questions. I better hurry up. Otherwise, I won't be able to finish the questions before I die. <laughs> I have a strong habit of resolving any worries by thinking of the reasons not to fear. That's okay. During meditation, when fear arises, I try to let go, but the mind feels uncomfortable and keeps on trying to reason out the fear. How do I break this habit? Oh, it depends actually who you are, but if you really trust me, you've got nothing to fear at all about meditation. You even stop all the thinking. What is fear anyway? Fear is when the mind loses the present moment and projects onto the future. And it projects onto the future with negativity. You know, you, you go off to the future and you think all the things which can go wrong, which are possible. But also what's possible is what can go right. So when I think of the future, if ever I do, I always think of the things which will go right, which means that I don't need to worry about the future. Because things go wrong, things go right. Anyway, I think things will go right. My goodness, it's scrolling down so much now. now. I better do it quickly. Why would I hear sounds just like celestial sounds wherever I... Oh, I've lost that now. Don't scroll so fast. Please slow down. Okay, uh, pick one. Okay, pick one. How do we measure our progress in meditation? You don't measure progress, you measure ingress. In other words, how deep you go into this moment, know where you go to next. But if you want to find out how much you are growing in meditation, the best way is to ask the people you live with or the people you work with, because you can deceive yourself so easily and you miss just the amazing things which are happening in your meditation, which is one of the reasons why that people come on these retreats and the usual stories sometimes say, I didn't really want to come, but my kids sent me, mummy, mummy, you must go to meditation. Well, I don't feel like it, it's too busy. Mummy, mummy, you must go. I don't want to. Mummy, mummy, go. Meditation. Why? Because you're a much nicer mummy when you come back from meditation. Your kids know how good it is for you. Or even <sighs> your boss. Now, I don't know why not more people do this, but when I was in visiting Thailand many years ago, I was on one of the internal flights and not knowing what to do, I picked up the copy of the uh, the Bangkok Post newspaper. And there's a big article in there about the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok had won the Hotel of the Year Award. It's a very hard award to win. You know, the best hotel in the world, the Oriental, it's on the banks of the Mekong River. And they had a description of why they had won. And the managing director, whatever he was, the guy in charge of the hotel said that the main reason why he thought that his hotel won that award that year was that he sends all the staff, no, on a roster, not all the same time, he sends all that staff to uh, a monastery for a retreat for one week every year, paid for by the hotel not on their holiday time. It's almost like their, their work training. And that was in Suan Mo, Kajan Buddha Dasa's monastery. And he would send them there, everybody, for one week every year to learn how to meditate, really deeply relaxed, and learn how to be mindful and sensitive to the guests. So their hospitality ability really improved. And I thought, as all I know about meditation, that is probably a very wonderful thing to do if you're in the hospitality industry, to send all of your staff, you know, not at the same time again, on a roster throughout the year on a meditation retreat, even just for three or four days, just to actually relax and learn how to be aware of yourself and aware of others. So that created huge amounts of progress. 
But, you know, sometimes when you're on long retreats, you think, oh, you're getting nowhere. Oh, my mind is thinking too much. I never find some peace. <laughs> sometimes you don't notice how this meditation works. And there's one gentleman on a three-month retreat with me, and he thought he was going, getting nowhere, and he was about just to leave the retreat center. And I said, well, before you go, I need something from the, the shopping mall. I was actually sort of making out. We didn't need it, but it wasn't that important. I said, would you mind getting in a car and just going to pick it up for us? He said, yeah, sure, no trouble at all, because his meditation was not so good in his judgment. So off he went in the car, and he went to the shopping mall to pick up this item for me. And afterwards, he came back and he said, that shopping mall is crazy. It's so noisy. People are mad in that shopping center. I said, well, that's where you used to almost live before you came here. Now you've found out how your meditation has done a lot of progress. And he went silent for a while. He said, hey, was that why you sent me to the shopping mall? Yes. I didn't need that thing. Other people could supply it for me. I wanted you to see how much you had changed in the six weeks you've been here. You didn't notice it because everyone else is peaceful in the monastery. Now you have something to judge it by, by going into a shopping center, which you know you found normal when you were you know, in the world, but now you're in the monastery. How much different is it? And he really agreed. And he learned how much progress he had made, which he had missed. He hadn't seen that calmness coming inside of him. So many of you who, especially if you are resident uh, in the hotels, or if you come to the temple and you just go home and you just you don't turn on the TV or the internet or something, you just really relax and you just have a sleep and go to the temple again in the morning. And if you just make it like a, a residential retreat, you will find after six days, it's amazing how peaceful you are. And of course, lastly, the other people, when you go back to work again, your bosses. <laughs> it's wonderful how they see you after you've been on a retreat. And the story I love telling, this lady from Sydney, and she said that she was an executive and she had to grovel. She said grovel to her boss to go to a retreat for nine days. And eventually you let her go. And when she went back to Sydney, she sent me an email on Monday afternoon. And she got back to work on Monday and saying, my boss said, I don't know what you're doing in that Buddhist meditation center in Perth. I don't know what drug they're giving you, but please bring me back some next time you go. <laughs> she saw, I don't know, but the boss saw that this woman was really changed peaceful and happy and able to work so much better. So you can see there's huge amounts of change when you meditate, which is great. Anyway, dear Ajahn, my daughter has a chronic illness. As mentioned by Ajahn, meditation will greatly help in her medical condition. But how do I get to, to do serious meditation? She's 26. Look, the best way is to get these guided meditations. Because the guided meditations, you now she can get one of those. Whichever one she likes, they're for free. These are ones I do, are for free. And just find the one she likes and just listen to it. She can listen to it anywhere, any place, for however long she wants. She doesn't have to sit cross-legged in a group. You now she's got a chronic illness. So anywhere she likes and just listen to it and see how it goes with her. Because then what happens is that it works and she realizes that. And she really gets into it after a while. So just download a guided meditation somewhere and just give it to her. Give her a couple of guided meditations, choose which one you like, and then just whenever you want to listen to it, but don't force it on her, otherwise she rebel. 26 years of age, she has to be her own woman. So just suggest, here you go, give it a try, it works. And see what happens. Oh no, you've got, can you tell a ghost story, please? Thank you. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna go and see this woman in a day or two. Um, <laughs> this was, uh, we have our main cemetery board. It's in the, the suburb of Karakata in Perth. And so there's one of our members, Buddhist members, she's a Burmese woman or brought up in Burma. 
actually, well, when she was young, but she moved over to Australia for a long time ago. And she's very, very, very intelligent. So she has her own IT company. And so she managed to get the contract to upgrade the IT system of the Perth Cemeteries Board. So she accepted a contract that was a very uh, good contract, going to make quite a bit of money. But she was really afraid of ghosts. And she was working in the middle of the cemetery in the offices there. So she made a resolution. She would always leave early every evening never ever to be the last person in the offices alone in the middle of the cemetery. So everything was going wonderful until the last day. All she needed to do on a Friday afternoon was print out the report. That's the only work which was left. And then she finished the contract but it was taking a little bit more time than she expected. So she was going to be the last person in the office. Just in the final day, she said, oh, what the heck? It should be okay. So everyone else went home and she was in the office in the middle of this big cemetery in a quiet part of Perth. And so she pressed a button and she went over to the printer, as you do, to check the long report, just to make sure the pages were coming out. And that's when it happened. In the middle of about 50 or 60 page report, right in the middle of it, a page came out of the printer, which shocked her to the bone. It was not her report. It was a page with a picture of a gravestone in a cemetery. That was not in her report. She never created that. It just came out of the printer by itself. In the middle of her printout. And she freaked out. She just immediately, she, did, she ran out the door into her car. She left all the doors open, all the windows, nothing locked up at all. On a Friday afternoon, got into her car and just sped out of the cemetery and it wasn't that far to a bridge which went over the Swan River in Perth. She crossed that bridge and then she had a sigh of relief. She believed that ghosts can't cross rivers. Whew. And then, you know, she calmed herself down. And then, you know, she couldn't do nothing. She wasn't going to go back there until Monday. So when she went back there on Monday, all the staff had said, why did you leave all the doors open? Why did you leave the place in such a mess? She told the story and the people who worked in the, in the office said, oh, yeah, that always happens on the weekend. Sometimes we tidy everything up on a Friday afternoon. We lock the doors and when we go there on a Monday morning, we notice that the ghosts have had a party. Everything's all over the place. But they get used to that. That's the ghost story of Karakata Cemetery in Perth. A true story told by one of my disciples. Do you believe that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the ghosts can't harm you there. They're, they're quite cool ghosts. Dear Ajahn, I am struggling with poor mental health and sometimes it is very difficult to overcome the symptoms by meditation and mindfulness alone. Are there any other strategies to overcome these besides medication? It really depends on what the poor mental health is and what type of meditation you're doing. I usually teach this type of meditation further on in the retreat, but because you asked, I like to introduce the, the Emperor's Three Questions meditation, which is, what is the most important time? Now, it's the only time you really have. What is the most important thing to watch in meditation? Whatever is in front of your mind right now. What are you aware of right now? Right now, what's in front of you? That's important. That's the second Empress question. And what are you going to do with this feeling you have? You never try to cure it. You never try and stigmatize it. You never be negative towards it. Or if it's beautiful, to celebrate it. 
whatever you're aware of right now, you care for it. It's beautiful opening the door of your heart to this feeling right now. You're, it's here. And so it's only when you start projecting into the future, I don't think I can stand this, I don't want this. That is what makes it worse. If you're trying to cure it, get rid of it, run away from it. But if you care for this present moment, really care for it, even if you don't feel that good, you care for it. I don't know why I have to deal with this, but it's already here. I'm stuck with this. I'm going to be with this. And you find if you're with this present moment, even if you call it, you know, poor mental health, you find your mental health just really increases in positive energies. You find if you're with this moment, things like depression, they just disappear. The energy comes back to your mind. You really wake up and you're wonderful. This lady, I think from the north of Australia, now she can travel. She's coming to see me because she hasn't arrived yet, probably tomorrow, because these teachings overcame her depression. Nothing else overcame it, she says, and she just has to come and say thank you to me. I was just asking when I'm going to be here. Okay. Dear Ajahn, during meditation, my back doesn't feel comfortable. In any one portion, I keep moving. How important is to have a straight back and to be still? Straight back is not important. Stillness is important. So if you even want to lie down on the floor, that's fine. Because sometimes, uh, I don't know what's wrong with your back or what's right with it. But you, know, you find the best posture for yourself. I know in my temple, over in Perth, that the first seats which fill up are the ones against the wall. So people can lean against the wall and they feel so comfortable leaning against a nice solid surface. So you find the, the most comfortable posture. You won't, be, you won't find any posture which is totally comfortable. You'll find one which is the best. And usually that's enough. And it is okay during meditation. If you feel like moving, then move. You don't have to sit still throughout the meditation as long as you have moments, maybe many moments, five minutes or 10 minutes where you don't need to move, that's wonderful. And after a while, if you don't want to move, sometimes the, you surprise yourself and the body becomes really, 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 really comfortable. You now, when I started meditating, uh, sometimes you were tired and my back would slump, even slumps these days sometimes, and my head would be down. And I would sometimes fight that. And I realized that's wrong to fight. I leave it like that. I was enough mindfulness to know that my body was slumped, but it felt reasonably peaceful. And then it surprised me. The first time this happened, I was really quite amazed. The body straightened up by itself. I never told it to, but it straightened up. And from that day on, I trust my body. I ask my body, how do you want to sit? My back, how do you want to be? Do you want to lean back, lean forward, lean to the left, lean to the right? What do you want back? And then just be kind enough to your back. And the back says, well, nothing is really comfortable, but this is the most comfortable. Okay, we can sit like that. And if you want to move, fine by me. That kindness, rather than controlling, will bring you comfort in your body. Dear Ajahn Brahm. Oh, I've got dear John Brahm. That's a nice name. I don't, mind leaving, I don't mind leaving the A off there, but please never take the M off the last word. Otherwise, I become called Ajahn Bra, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> While doing breath meditation, the moment I notice that I've started watching the breath from another mind, my meditation falls apart. This happens constantly when I try to meditate, and I find it hard to move beyond that point. You start watching the breath from another mind, okay, from a different place. Meditation starts to fall apart. So one thing you can do, you can make this... Uh, what we call um, reconditioning your mindfulness. At the beginning of the meditation is reprogramming your mindfulness was the word I was looking for. So when you start meditating, you tell your mind, if that happens, I'm starting watching the breath from another mind. I think you mean from a, from a distance. When that starts to happen, you tell yourself, my meditation will not fall apart. I'll just stay there. When this happens, I will just stay there. When this happens, I will just stay there. 
Repeat it three times in your own words. And then what happens usually, you say that at the beginning of the meditation. And then when that thing happens, it's like automatically, the mind knows what to do, it just stays. What you're not trying to get anywhere or develop anything. It just stays there, you're nice and peaceful. When that becomes peaceful and stable, then the mind goes deeper all by itself. So don't try, don't move beyond that point. Just tell your mindfulness at the very beginning what it needs to do. And then you find it works. Okay, another question, please. Is it necessary to do the super meditation? No, it's not necessary to do the super meditation. If a super meditation is seeing the, the ugly side of life. And, you know, sometimes, especially if a person is got a lot of say lust. You know, I must admit that I didn't have lots of lust, but I knew it was very dangerous you know, being a monk, a young monk, you know, in a place like Thailand, because I've told you many times before that the most dangerous animal in the jungles of Thailand wasn't tigers. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? Thai it was girls. the tigers. <laughs> 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 so sometimes, you know, after a while, you, you know, you started looking at them and think, oh my goodness, I must stop looking. But they were quite attractive. Ah, what should I do? So what I did, and I told the other monks this, I deliberately started to, you know, if I saw a beautiful girl come into monastery, I started looking for her pimples. Because all the girls had pimples somewhere. And they tried to cover them up with makeup, but they couldn't afford makeup in that part of Thailand. So eventually I'd find something which was, was imperfect. And that was enough to get rid of my male idea of wanting this perfect, beautiful woman. And so I could see that you know, they were nice people, very kind, very wonderful, but they weren't perfect enough for me to sort of lose my mindfulness. And so I did that for many times in life, anything which was really attractive, we try and find the, the, the negative side of it. But I found that many people, that they do that too much and all they see is a negative and they get very, you know, not very nice people to be with. So that we, you balance. You know, with the asupa, seeing the faults in things, we're seeing the beauty in things. And for most people in our modern world, we know how to see the faults in things. We're very good fault finders. I can see the two bad bricks in my wall so easily. But we don't know how to see the 998 good bricks. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't teach much asupa, teach a lot of kindness metta, open the door of your heart. Because that and manages you to see the beauty in things. And we've always been well trained to be critical and discriminate, discriminatory, but now we're seeing the beauty in things. And that's really, really, really valuable in today's world. So do you know, things like metta or the perception of the beautiful. That's more important than your super practices. Can I jump? Can you advise how to practice Satipatthana while doing our daily chores, Sadhu times three? Depends what your daily chores are, but how I remember Ajahn Chah teaching me, and he teached others, whatever you are doing, whatever job that is, you give it 100%. So if you're typing up an email on your computer, you don't start thinking about the, the feelings in your fingertips as it's touching the keyboards. That means you're not really focusing on the main task which is you know, writing your email. And if you're sawing a piece of wood, you don't think of the feelings in your hand, otherwise you're not really sawing a piece of wood properly. And if, for example, you're driving a car and you're taking me to the airport somewhere, I'm sure it'll happen again in not so long. You're driving me to the airport somewhere. I don't want you to just start being aware of just the feelings of your hands on the steering wheel. I want you to be watching the traffic. So you get to the airport in time and you don't kill me. So sometimes people have some weird ideas of what Satipatthana is. So if you're on a retreat, then you can do all those things because that's your main job. But remember, for Satipatthana, the most important part of this, and I don't know why people don't teach this because it's right there from the suttas, you only do Satipatthana once you have abandoned your five hindrances or weakened them. 
Vinaye Loke Abhija Dharmanasa is a Pali. It's often translated into English as having overcome grief and covetousness for the world. Which may first read that. So I looked in the Pali, looked in the text, and found out it does mean having weakened the five hindrances. So before you do Satipatthana, you have to have weakened the five hindrances. And that is the job of renunciation, letting go, meditation, keeping precepts. Then Satipatthana you do. Anyway, what is the benefit of doing open awareness meditation with our eyes open, staring at nature? If you're staring at nature, I mean like going to the forest or going into the uh, the cliffs or the ocean. The nice thing about, med about nature is you cannot control it. And then King Knut tried to control the tides and it failed and became sort of famous because of that or infamous. So one of the nice things, you're watching something you can never own, nor can you control. So it makes you sort of let go and just enjoy things which you cannot own or control. I think that's one of the reasons why nature does tend to calm you down. Also, it's very difficult to, to capture nature. Sometimes people take photographs of nature, but it misses out so much. I was just joking with one of the, I was being driven somewhere a few days ago, and I said that sometimes when, whenever they take photographs of the monastery where I live, they show it to me, said, have a look at this. I don't know how many times I've seen a photograph of Bodhinyana Monastery where I live. And I asked, where's that? That looks nice. <laughs> so that's your monastery where you live. Oh, yeah. But the photographs look very different from the reality when you're actually living here. Because the photographs only capture a slight piece of the information. Which is one of the reasons why nature, you can't capture it. You can't keep it. Nature is always changing. And so that's the other beautiful thing. It's anicca. And it teaches you the only real way to enjoy nature is in this moment. And don't take photographs of it or videos of it. Enjoy it now and let it go. So that's one of the reasons why the nature becomes a quite calming place to do some meditation. Over in our retreat center in Jhana Grove, I often encourage People just to sit on the on the benches outside our kitchen and just watch the trees grow. Which is, of course, you can't watch trees grow. It's just an excuse to sit there and just watch nature by doing nothing because you can't really do not, anything with nature. Just watch it. And after a while, you get very peaceful. Sometimes people get their first experience of peace watching nature rather than watching their breath. Because when they're watching nature, they, they do let go. When they're watching their breath, they're trying to get into deep meditation, they're doing something. So sometimes it gets so peaceful watching nature, so that's why we encourage it. And after you can learn how to let nature be, you get so peaceful, then you can sit down, close your eyes, and then you find the meditation just starts taking off, goes deeply inside. Anyway, why would I hear sounds just like celestial sounds wherever I go, even during meditation and chanting? I don't know if it's wherever you go. If you're at work, I don't know if you hear celestial sounds or in the, in the house. But if you do lots and lots of meditation, you become very sensitive. Sometimes almost in the background, there is this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sounds. This can often happen during meditation retreats when a person starts to get deep meditation. That just before the sense of sound turns off, you hear beautiful sounds. It's like what we call the nimittas in meditation. Most people see nimittas as lights, it's beautiful lights, yellows and blues, which are more yellow or more blue than you see with your open eyes. But this is in your mind. It's a stage of meditation, which I'm, again, I'll probably talk about later on. But sometimes people don't see the lights. They see the same sort of experience, but they see it through sound and it's gorgeous sound. Again, they say it's like heavenly chanting. No one else hears it in that room, only you, because only you are in the deep meditation. If you've done lots of meditation, 
And sometimes you can hear that in many places, many times, even when you're not meditating. So that could be what's happening. Ajahn, can I still become a monastic if one of my parents because he don't want to be alone, even though he's already well taken care of with help? What are my duties? You can actually even tell your parents that you know, there are many people. He doesn't want to be alone. He doesn't have to be alone. Depends on your age. If you can wait for a while, you know, until your other father uh, gets better or he found you know, someone to look after him a long time, now, that'd be wonderful. But you know, even uh, an example of that was the story of Sariputta. Sariputta's father had died, but his mother disapproved of him becoming a monk. And no, it's actually Sariputta's, um, I think, younger brother wanted to become a monk. And the Buddha asked him, you know, does, you know your, your father has passed away. Does your mother approve? He said, no, he doesn't. I mean, the Buddha would have known that because he'd known that Sariputta's mother did not approve at all of Sariputta becoming a monk. And, you know, he became a monk very early on before those rules were set down. And so the Buddha said, well, have you got an elder brother who approves of you being a monk? And the young candidate said that my elder brother is Sariputta. Of course you would approve. He said, okay, that's good enough. And so, <laughs> and so the Buddha ordained this young man. It was Sariputta's younger brother. So in other words, you know, if there is a loophole somewhere, we'll find it for you. And becoming a monastic is just a, such a wonderful thing to do that you know, that's why we find those loopholes. And you can look after your father, or he says he, you can look after your father, and he doesn't have to be alone. And sometimes you can look after him so much better if you're a monastic. You've got more kindness, more loving kindness, more care. And if he comes and sees you as a monastic, and just what a wonderful service you're doing, it makes him so happy. That's my boy. Look how people listen to him and how much he helps the world. It makes your father be proud of you. Dear Ajahn, out of compassion, how can Anatta be seen? Thank you most gratefully. That's obviously a big question. If I can answer that very easily, you'll all be enlightened. And if you become enlightened today, what will you do for the next five days? <laughs> so I can't answer that so you all understand it straight away. <laughs> I'm only joking. But anyway, how can Anatta be seen? Sometimes instead of doing it philosophically, I always like to see, well, what do you think you own? Because this is a teaching of the Buddha. When there's a self, there's things which belong to you. When there's things which belong to you, there's a self. So what do you own? And then you look at yourself, what you own, all your possessions, and we don't really own them. You now, when you die, you can't take them with you, as everybody knows. And even just you know, before you die, you lose a lot of stuff. Even your, your intelligence, all your knowledge. Oh, you know that... Honestly, I was quite fluent in Thai when I was in Thailand. I would translate for Ajahn Chah and I'd be in, like, invited to give talks in Thai. But I've lost a lot of that now because they haven't reinforced and, and made use of it. So that's all, all that hard work of learning Thai is mostly gone. And all that hard work of learning theoretical physics and quantum theory, that's mostly gone. It wasn't mine anyway. I had it temporarily. And also, to make it very clear, that sometimes the monastery in which I live, I'm only a visitor here. I said, no, you are built the monastery. You're the abbot. You're the teacher. So only temporarily. And that's why that I practice this wonderful thing about being a visitor. Sometimes I walk through the grounds of Bodhinyana Monastery, and I... Remember, I'm visiting this place. I don't own it. It's not mine. I'm only visiting it. And I do that. And some morning, somebody comes up and says, where's that jumper? I said, I don't know. I'm not the abbot today. <laughs> I pretend I'm not me. I don't pretend. I say, I am not me. That's a truth, a very deep truth. So when I'm a visitor, I can enjoy this place. Just like when you visit, I can enjoy it. So one way to see Anatta is boy be more of a visitor to places rather than being an owner. 
visit your body. Don't think you own this body. So as a visitor, you have to care for it much more. If you own it, you tend to want to tell it what to do. You're visiting your mind. You're visiting your meditation. So don't tell the mind what to do. You're just a visitor. So behave properly. And then your mind gets grateful. The more you are, the more you think you are, the more you control, the more difficult your meditation will be. And if you're only visiting your body or visiting your mind, it's much easier. Anyway, during meditation, occasionally I had the sensation of beautiful breaths. Ah, oh, lovely. But most of the time I was just at the state of present moment. What should I do to improve? Don't try to improve. Okay, here's the story. You know, there's sometimes, you know, I tell jokes. And some of those jokes, I actually, honestly, I make up myself. And every now and again, you, you, know, you turn on the internet and you find somebody else tell them. That's really fun when you say, I made up, up that joke. But this is a very wonderful joke because it's very meaningful for meditators. It's about the migrant. The migrant came to Australia. He was a doctor in his home country, but he couldn't get a job as a doctor. He didn't have the qualifications which were recognized in Australia. So I had to get a job on the building site. And he worked really hard Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and never got paid. Nothing. In those days, he came home and said, you get any pay yet? Said his wife, no, nothing, zero, zip. And on Thursday, he went to work. He worked really hard on Thursday, but still got nothing. And on Friday, he said, I don't really want to go back to work. In Australia, they just, they exploit migrants. They take advantage of us. I'm a doctor, but I have to work on a building site and I work really hard. I get nothing, nothing, no money at all. But he went to work on a Friday anyway. And on Friday, he didn't work hard at all. And the boss gave him a big pay packet. And he was so happy, he even went home early. And he told his wife, I finally discovered how things happen in Australia. From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Friday. <laughs> no other day of the week. <laughs> you can't go to work just on payday, thinking you're going to get paid a lot of money, because you're paid on Friday for all the hard work you did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and also that Friday. So you get the delightful breath, because of all that other hard work you did in meditation, when you get the beautiful, delightful breath, look at that as payday. And afterwards, you have to go back to work again and build up the techniques and skills of meditation. And just like any career, after a while, you know, you become more skillful. And of course, you get bigger pay on and more paydays. In other words, you get more delightful breaths and even more delight than the delightful breaths as you keep going on. So what should I do to improve? I'll just let it be. You got a pay packet, so enjoy and then go back to work afterwards. I don't think you have to get a pay packet every day. Okay, next question, please. Here we go. Can one meditate on a respected person of the opposite gender for loving kindness meditation? Some say might develop romantic attachment. If you are a female and you uh, meditate on me, I don't think you'll develop romantic attachment. So I'm old. Actually, you know, I'm not really, I always thought I wasn't really old. With my monks the other day, you know, I was, I just telling them, just you know, talking generally with them. And I said, I'm getting old. You know what my monks said? They said, no, I jump you're not getting old. I thought, aren't they nice, my monks? They're so kind. And then they continued their conversation. You're not getting old, I jump you're already old. <laughs> 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 I thought, wow, you got me there. But, if it's really loving kindness meditation, real loving kindness doesn't own anything. The door of my heart is open to you no matter what you do, where you go. So loving kindness is not keeping something. It's not owning it, it's freeing it. I've often said the most wonderful act of loving kindness is to, is to let something go. You do that to your parents when they get very old or maybe even a partner or a child sometimes when they get very sick. And the parent has to do this really incredible thing of letting their child go into death and get reborn somewhere. And I've seen that, and sometimes people rise to the occasion. It's not pleasant, but they said, child, you know, I don't want you to suffer anymore. You know, your body is just not very viable. So 
please. Off you go. You have my permission. Enjoyed our time together. It's only a short time we've had together, but what a wonderful time it was. I'll always remember you. I let you go with love. So that's how these things work. Okay. Now you can choose another one. Uh, put some water in my cup and have a glass of water. Here you go. I have a strong habit of resolving any worries by thinking of the reasons not to fear. During med, hey? Right, we've had this question before, haven't we? Mm -hmm. I reckon so. I remember that one. Mm -hmm. Unless I've asked it again. Drink. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's the same one. It's the third time it's come up. Is it? I, I oh, no, I don't know. Here we go. During meditation, when I focus on my breath, I end up controlling its rise and fall. What should I do? Can I focus on my heartbeat or fifth sense or something else instead? Thank you. Yeah, that is a problem because you focus on your breath. Don't focus on your breath, especially don't focus on it too soon. That's one of the reasons why you do, I do the body sweeping first of all, to get my body really relaxed. And then as you'll find out tomorrow morning, then I do this peaceometer business. Now I look at my mind, my peaceometer, how peaceful am I right now? Or how disturbed am I right now? And I learn how to relax my mind, very peaceful. Then I start to do the present moment awareness and the silence inside the mind. I'll go into more detail on that tomorrow. But when I get to silence and present moment, I don't, I'm not controlling anything. I'm just watching it. It's almost, and then the breath comes to me. I never actually, honestly, I never actually look for my breath. And when I become very peaceful, the breath comes to me. And it's always so much more peaceful when it comes, rather than I try to find it and grab it and hold on to it. So controlling it, after a while, it will just run away from you. No one likes to be with a control freak. Not even your breath. So it's unpleasant that way. So don't even look at your breath yet. Just let it come to you. Make your mind really, really peaceful and calm. And then the breath will come to you. And it's already just quite, quite nice. You don't control it at all. Your body knows how to breathe. It's been breathing without you telling it how to do it for such a long time. It's the expert on breathing. So just let the body do what it needs to do. You just do the watching, the observing. Then it becomes very delightful and very easy to watch. You don't have to control it or force it because it's delightful. I love to watch delightful things. Just <laughs> because it's very hot in Perth right now. It was actually 41 degrees today, really hot. But I saw this, couple, this parrot, it was in the bird bath and it was just soaking itself. I mean, it was just soggy with water and it was enjoying itself so much. Because it was a hot day, when I walked past it, it lifted its head up, it wasn't gonna move away from that bird bath, not for me. It was just enjoying itself to the max. And I just got so much joy out of that. I didn't need to focus on it. The scenery, the scene of a bird which is so wet, just drew me to it. And I just watched it for a while. It's joyful. You don't have to force your mind onto joyful things. So once the mind becomes a beautiful mind, a beautiful breath, a delightful breath, once the breath becomes delightful, then you don't need to put any effort in at all. You just watch it and it goes very still and peaceful then. How to meditate while enduring bodily pain. Present moment awareness is really important. You don't enjoy it, you're with it in the present moment. It's here, enjoying this moment. The idea of enjoying bodily pain, I remember just oh, when I was a kid seeing these movies and there's someone who was about to be tortured you know, by some people wanting information from you. And they would say, they would never actually torture them or whip them or do anything yet. They would just show them all the equipment and they say, you're gonna wish you'd never be born. They actually just get the fear up, first of all. In other words, what's going to happen to me next? And oh, I can't stand this. When you go into the future, the future is very scary. 
if you have that negative mind. But in this moment, you're enduring it. It's here right now. You don't know how long it's going to last. And it might only last a moment. I've been in some pains and I remember this toothache I had and it just went in a moment with agony. Not being able to sleep, no, not able to do. And I did this letting go thing and it just disappeared immediately. And it shocked me just how physical pain can disappear quickly in a moment. Weird, but it's true. But what was actually happening, the main part of pain is the, um, the mental response. 90% of it is how the emotions play with the physical feeling of pain. The actual physical experience is actually quite small and quite tolerable, even just extreme pain. It's what we add to it. And that's why, you know, torturers, they work on the emotions and the fear rather than the physical feeling itself. So that's how we deal with this, to actually to split that pain into the emotional response. I don't want this, I can't stand this, and all that thinking which goes with it, and the physical feeling. And you learn so much from that. And you're amazed as how much you can tolerate. And no problem at all. Okay, I was, there's a story about that, but it goes on a bit. So I'll answer, I'll answer the next question. In Kalama Sutra, the Buddha says not to rely on logic. We heard Ajahn Brahmadi's explanation this afternoon. Could you please explain a little more, Ajahn? Can we rely on our experiences? Aren't our experiences also based on our interpretation? What does the Kalama Sutra say? The Kalama Sutra said you should not sort of rely on suttas or any old knowledge. So you can't rely on the Kalama Sutra. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to Ajahn Bhamadi today. Said, oh, Ajahn Bhamadi, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an oxymoron to teach the Kalama Sutta. <laughs> but anyway, what to rely, not to rely just, just on logic. And the reason is, you know, because you know, not to actually deny reason, but not just to rely on logic by itself, because as any philosopher knows, it depends on your assumptions, you know, which you start off with. And from that as assumptions, you work out logically what the next step is. If your assumptions aren't correct, sometimes the conclusions aren't correct. That's one of the, the problems with logic. Logic by itself is fine. But what assumption did you make? So, uh, your experiences. Aren't our experiences also based on our interpretation? Yes, they are. So what can you rely on? Oh, I can't resist this story. This was that story in a London, no, sorry, in, in Imperial College in London. One of my mates told me about this experiment where just a bunch of physicists, experimental physicists, were going to see a demonstration of levitation. It's a levitating flower pot experiment done by the Society of Psychical Research in London. And so he said, I can levitate this flower pot. And got all his mates who were you know, top professors and experimental physicists in London to come to this demonstration because you know, he had a bit of a clout in the physical community in London. And he came into the lecture theater with a flower pot. He put the flower pot on the table and so there's no wires or anything. He said, we're now going to levitate this. He turned on all the cameras. So if it worked, they'd have photographs, proof. Now, ultraviolet cameras, infrared cameras, he had the work set. And then he asked all the professors, you probably remember the story when I say this, asked all the professors in the audience to start chanting OM, just that one word, OM, over and over again, to create the, the ambience, the mood for this to work. And they're all chanting OM, OM, OM. And that is when the flower pot lifted up into the air. It actually levitated, it worked. And then afterwards, they had photos of it, everything. Afterwards, they asked these physicists what you thought of that. And I remember one of them said, what are you talking about? It didn't lift at all. It was on the table all the time, but here's a photograph, that's fake. And that was the whole purpose of the experiment. The flower pot did lift off the table. And because some people thought that's impossible, that can't happen. 
It's against all the laws of physics. For that reason, they didn't see it. Even though they were looking, it did not register in their conscious awareness. And of course, afterwards, they explained to everybody that there was a huge electromagnet under the bench. It's just basic science, electromagnetic. But they never let anyone know that first. And they had to do the chanting of Om, 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 because when they turned on that very strong current, people would have noticed it straight away. You know, the hum of strong electricity. So they did the Om to master the, master the trick, the deception. But the main point of the experiment was even though it lifted, some people could not see it. Be not because it was out of their vision, it's because it was too challenging to see, deeply challenging. And that is actually how even the Buddhists taught the cognitive distortion of our perception. Even something's happening, we can't see it because it's just too difficult for us to understand. We block it out at a very fundamental level. And so the only way to um, avoid that is again to meditate, to reduce the power of the five hindrances and the five hindrances are just really, really gone. Then whatever you see, you can trust. You don't distort reality anymore. There's nothing you want. There's nothing you're afraid of. That's the negativity. The mind is powerful. It's got no sloth and torpor. It's not restless. It's poised. There's no doubt. Five hindrances are restrained or even gone for a while. And that is when what you see, you can trust. Sometimes it shocks you. You see things you've never seen before. Scary things, but you're not scared. Simply because the mind is now free of the hindrances. Anyway, Ajahn, how does one deal with an addiction or bad habit? Try to be kind to the person. It works for a short while. Any advice on how can do to prevent relapse? Yeah, if somebody's addicted, it's a really tough one because as one person once said to me, they came to Body Nine Monster, they were addicted to heroin. And they said they had so much good support, but they said a thousand times a day they had to say no. One time they say yes, and they're back on the habit again. And they're also saying that you know, when you say that yes, it's a lot of the time they're strong, but they have the down days or the times when they're not so strong as usual. So one of the supporting mechanisms, don't um, put the person down. They're trying their very best and they feel so much shame and they feel they're not worth anything sometimes. And that means they don't even try. They haven't got the strength to feel that they can beat that addiction. Some people do beat those addictions. Well done. So first of all, always build them up. Never criticize people with addictions. Realize that, you know, you don't know how hard it is. Only they know. And the next thing, obviously, is to make sure that what they're addicted to is not readily available. In other words, it's not just you know, in the drawer of their bed. It's not sort of uh, just next door. But the harder it is to access whatever they're addicted to, then the more likely it is before they actually get there to take another hit of their, whatever they take, that they come to their senses and they realize it's not worth it. Because you have those down times, but then those down times don't last that long. And if somehow or other they can just put it off or restrict it for a little while, then they say, no, no, I don't want to do this. And they don't so say yes. So see if you can put a space, as long as you possibly can, between the time they think, yes, I'll do it, and before they have their hand on the bottle of alcohol or on that uh, syringe. Next question, how do we fight dozing off during meditation? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Don't fight dozing off. First of all, make sure that you're comfortable enough and the temperature in the room is not too hot. Because if it's really hot, of course, you know, you tend to doze off, you get good food. And I say that because I had so much trouble dozing off when I was a young monk in Thailand. When I was in the northeast of Thailand, and when I thought about it afterwards, I thought, you know, even if the, please excuse me, even if the Buddha was born in England and ate that type of food, he would be dozing off because he was malnourished. 
in a climate which is so hot and humid and oppressive, sleep deprived, and then all the reasons do doze off. And then one day I had to do visas. So I went down to Bangkok and there was this, this uh, new building where we were staying and they had a meditation, had a, a room which was air conditioned. I remember I've been a monk for 46 years. So 45 years ago, even in Bangkok, there wasn't that many places which were air conditioned. And in the temple, they had an air conditioned room. And so we got hold of the key for it because we get up early in the morning and we'd meditate there from 3.30 to about five o'clock every morning. And it was no mosquitoes in there. We we're eating good food. We we're having good sleeps at nighttime. And it was air conditioned. And the first day I meditated, there was no sloth and torpor at all. And I thought, wow, now I know where that sloth and torpor came from. It was physically induced, not enough sleep, not good food, and just too hot for me. So that's one of the reasons why that it's been a very hot day today. So please forgive you know, Ajahn Bamadi or myself if ever we said something we shouldn't because the heat just sometimes fries your brain if you're uh, from Norway or from England, that's where we two were born. But when it gets colder, it's supposed to be cooler tomorrow, which is great. Then of course you're much sharper, I find. So anyway, so if you do doze off, which precept do you break when you doze off? None, because it's nature. And the best way when you're dozing off is to let yourself doze off. You have some mindfulness, not great mindfulness, but a tiny bit of mindfulness. Just see that mindfulness just in this present moment, be kind, be gentle, make peace with this. If you don't fight, it means you're not wasting energy. You don't waste energy, the energy just starts to build up. You come out of that doziness slowly, but you come out of it for sure when you don't fight. And when you do come out of it, your mind is really, really, really peaceful. So don't be afraid of it, don't fight it, get to know it, be peaceful with it, and it disappears by itself. Okay, I am confused. Doesn't confusion come up in a person when they are doubting or uncertain whether something is true? Doesn't confusion lead to understanding? How does confusion lead to harm? Okay, confusion can waste so much time for you. So you don't know which way to go, walking this way, that way. So this was a simile which I used to overcome the, what we call the fifth hindrance of doubt. You don't know which way to go, how to meditate, who to follow, which religion to follow, or no religion at all, what to do. So this was a, um, a simile which came up because I was um, walking in the forest, not the forest, so walking in the mountains of Scotland when I was a student. I, even then I just liked remote places and I was poor, so it didn't cost any money to sleep out in the forest or in the mountains in the summertime in Scotland. I loved that place. So I, you know, I stayed in a youth hostel, which was really poor, well, sorry, really cheap. And the one morning, there's only two of us in the youth hostel, the, the warden of the youth hostel said, why don't we go for a walk up one of the mountains this morning? I said, yeah, I'll go for a walk with you. So we walked up, it was a beautiful, clear, sunny day, no clouds in the sky at all, summertime in the north of Scotland. And we walked up this mountain together, we got to the top, we sat down, had a chat. It was no, not that sort of uh, that late. And I said, there's another mountain not so far away, let's walk up that one. He said, no, one mountain's enough for me. So he went back to the hostel and I just carried on to the next mountain. There's no taking my time. It wasn't sort of uh, an Olympic training, just enjoying nature. But then what happened really shocked me. In the end, it was a wonderful experience because as I was getting close to the summit of the next mountain, the clouds came in from the Atlantic Ocean really fast. And they came and they covered the mountain and much else of the area and they descended and I was covered in this mist. And it was so thick, surprisingly thick, that I could not you know, put my hand out. I couldn't see the, the hand clearly at the end of my arm. It was very thick mist. And I thought, you know, this is dangerous because you're up in a mountain, there's rocks, there's cliffs, you know, you better be careful which way you're going. 
So I just turned around and I decided to go back the way I came so I could climb down the mountain. But it was the first time I realized that I was totally lost. I went in a direction which was, I found out later was 100% opposite, 180 degrees opposite to the way I thought I was going. When you're in a mist, you don't have a sense of direction at all. And I realized this was very dangerous. I came to a cliff edge, a cliff you know, on that mountain. And it was again in the opposite direction I thought I was going. And that really scared me because one more step and I would have been dead. I mean, I'm not joking, not exaggerating. It was a, quite a steep cliff, I found out. And then I stopped and thought, I'm in trouble. This is dangerous, seriously dangerous. So what I did, I just you know, calmed myself down and just was logical. Because I said, I'm going to follow a stream. There's lots of water on those mountains. Follow a little walk of stream. And whichever way it goes, I will follow it. No matter which way it goes. Because I know that water always goes downhill. And I needed to go downhill. So I followed water. And of course, a little stream met another little stream, became bigger, and that met some more streams. And I followed this. I was zigzagging all over the place. But I'd always follow a stream. because so it was always going in the direction I wanted, was downhill. And of course, I soon got to below the cloud. And I could see everywhere I needed to go, and it was safe again. And of course, I got back to the youth hostel. I remember that simile, it saved my life, but I also use that to overcome doubt. I always manage to make sure that I'm going in the right direction when I'm meditating. Instead of being confused, I think, well, I know that if you can become more aware, more kind, more peaceful, more joyful, I'm going in the right direction. I follow that little stream of joy, peace, stillness, awareness, kindness, whichever way it will go. And I know what kindness is, I know what peace is, I know what joy is, I know what awareness is. So that's what I follow. And it just leads you zigzagging all down the mountainside until you come below, below the cloud cover. And you can see the whole uh, mountain, you know exactly where you need to go. That's how you overcome confusion, especially the confusion of doubt getting a few qualities which you really know are important and following them. So don't, you know, follow this particular teaching, that particular teaching, or this monk, or that monk, or that religion, that type of Buddhism. Go for something which is you really know is important, which is, you know, peace, kindness, awareness, joy. Follow those. And then it will lead you downhill. And dear Ajahn, are there our hearts or stream entrants in the world nowadays? Of course there are. That's how you become a stream winner. You go below the cloud. And when you blow the cloud, you can see which way you need to go. And you can see just where the freedom lies. But first of all, you have confusion. That's why the stream winner is someone who's overcome doubt. They can see where the paths are, which way to go to get the freedom. So of course there are, yes. Dear Ajahn, my daughter is four months pregnant. Can Ajahn please advise a simple meditation patterns for her? Thank you, Ajahn. Oh, just most meditation uh, practices are wonderful. So little, little oh, oh, she's not pregnant, she's pregnant. What does pregnant mean? <laughs> It's a typo. <laughs> that is pregnant, obviously. Got a kid inside. Advise a simple meditation practice for her. It's just learn to be in the present moment. And certainly don't be afraid. And I say this as a monk, as a male. Giving birth is easy. Thinking about it is the hard part. You don't think about it and... Sometimes people can give you lots of fear. Oh, yes, when I gave birth, it really hurt. Oh, just, you know, when I was pregnant, it was so heavy. Oh, so don't have fear at all. It's a very joyful time for you. And just, you know, just learn. If you can even suggest to yourself that when you do go into labor, 
Never call them labor pains, call them labor energies or the forces of, of birth. Something a bit more positive. You can say it's labor pains, oh my goodness. It makes you feel really bad. But labor energy is power. And it's an incredible thing. You're, you're participating in a birth. A being is coming through your body into the world. So those positive ideas, you know, they, that was actually started off in this uh, hippie camp over in San Francisco. And then they moved over to was it Oklahoma or somewhere. And I remember reading that book and just how that when women had uh, their births, how quickly they, they had the births and no labor pain at all. Labor energies, the same experience, but gave it a positive spin on it. So anyway, just you know, learn how to make peace, relax. And so whenever you do about to give birth, say, let go. Open the door of your heart so she can come out. Or he come out, whatever it is coming out. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I have an eight-year-old nephew with mild autism. I wanted to try teaching him meditation. Instead, he perceives it as closing eyes and napping for two minutes. Fine. How can I get started? His attention span is too short. To fine. To start by doing that, and then later on, you know, he'll just in, improve and have more attention. In other words, the fact that he's closing his eyes and sitting still, hopefully, that's a start. Don't raise the, the bar too high for him. It's a mild autism. And later on, he naps for two minutes, that's fine. Later on, he become more aware. So you're starting, well, only eight years of age, that's wonderful. I don't know what type of meditation you're teaching him, but how oh, I went to Singapore, I obviously when I used to go to Singapore, <coughs> and they they asked me to go and teach at the Little Gems kindergarten, kindergarten um, during WASAC, or well, around WASAC time, I thought, oh, how can you refuse? Even uh, teaching little kids, you know, which were really little kids, is a lot more difficult than teaching adults. So anyway, it was WASAC, and so you know, just make it up as you go along, as I always do. There was a big Buddha statue there, and I said, okay, now what happened on Waisak? First of all, the birth of the Buddha. And according to the tradition, when the Buddha was born, he walked seven steps and put his finger up, and no, the right way around, not the other way around, I told the kids. He said, I am the best in the world. This is my last birth. So I got all the kids to do that, to act it out. Because they were doing something rather than just listening, they found it much easier. Okay, and the other thing which happened on Waisak, the Buddha became enlightened. You see how the Buddha's sitting? Come on, sit down cross-legged. And they all sat down cross-legged because they seen the, the, the picture or they seen the Buddha statue, they all did that. And then I got him for the first time. I said, now imagine you're the Buddha, just enlightened. Imagine you're sitting under this beautiful shady tree and a cool wind is blowing. You've got your eyes closed. You're so relaxed, so at ease. You just became enlightened. I really got into it. And all the kids did too. And all the parents who were there watching, they really got into it. And I said the kids had never been so quiet for such a long time. Because they were imagining using something which kids were very good at. Imagining inside themselves, visualizing. And visualizing being a Buddha. And oh, that was so powerful that... The, the parents that evening I had to teach another meditation that evening. Can you teach that to us, please? <laughs> so I got all the, the grown-ups sort of doing the same meditation. I called it kids' meditation, but whoa, it was really powerful. So make sure that your that kid, mild autism, he's not always autistic. Sometimes he has episodes of autism. But just, that's fine. And even as he is, respect him. And see if you can teach him to visualize. Visualize being a Buddha, freshly enlightened. Because maybe they can get into that and they can feel it. They can feel peace rather than having to need to watch the breath to get peace. Give that a try. Next question. Dear Ajahn, please advise on how I can keep a cool head and a warm heart towards my kiddos. Age 10, girl and nine, boy, when they are being rude to me, especially when they use profanity at me. Thank you. So why do they use profanity at you? 
if you just say you don't understand those words or just don't react to them if you at all can. They're just trying to wind you up, get some sort of response from you. And if you don't respond, say, look, I don't understand those words. I don't hear them. And so when you speak nicely to them, I can understand them. So for a 10 year old and a nine year old, they can be pretty easy to, to retrain by not getting angry at them. You know, when they say profanity, if you get angry at them, then they've won. They've got a reaction out of you. They'll upset you for some reason or whatever. But if you just totally ignore them when they say bad words, they don't understand that word. And if they say something which is nice, you know, I understand that. So don't give them negativity. Don't, but give them positivity when they say nice things. When they say bad things, just ignore it. That's again, I always say why well, you've got two ears, one to go in, one to go out. So they try to be rude to you, but you don't accept it. You don't argue back at them. You just pretend not to hear it. It's nine o'clock. Yes, it's nine o'clock. And I didn't give you a toilet break. Please forgive me for my lack of compassion to you. Thank you, Ajahn. Are you okay? Instead of giving you a toilet break, can I give you, this is the end of the day for you? Can I give you a quick blessing? Yes, sure. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> the blessing for all of you stayed up. And after the blessing is finished, you're free to go to the toilet. <laughs> That's three so, sides also. So. Yeah, okay. I'll do the blessing first. Sabaro Gawini Muto Saba Santa Pawajito Saba Vera Mati Gando Nibuto Chatu Wang Bawa Sabiti O Viva Chantu Sabaro Go Wina Satu Mate Bawan Wantarayo Suki diga yu go pawa apiwa danha si litsa ni chang wuta perchali no chataro dhamma wa tanti ayuwa no sukhan bala. Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you even just over the internet very good so have a nice evening have a good night's sleep and i'll see you tomorrow thank you good night yes, good night <laughs>